Hi, Jean-François. Hi, Anand. Today, my guest is Jean-François Coté. He's a professor at the Laval University in Quebec City in Canada. He works with combinatorial optimization, stochastic programming, injury programming, applied to packing, routing, scheduling problems. He published many interesting papers in important journals such as Operations Research, Transportation Science, Inference Journal Computing, EJAR, and so on. So, Jean-Francois, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. And how are you? Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Despite um, the pandemic, is uh, relax. It's relax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you could share some of your stories uh, with us uh, today. And uh, how did everything start? Uh, are, where are you originally from? Are you from Quebec? I um, uh, was born in Ottawa, it's the capital of Canada. Um, and then my dad was in the in the army, and uh, here I don't know how it is in Brazil, but they move you around uh, here it's everywhere. So we moved to another city uh, a year or two later. Then uh, sister was born, and then we moved to another city, and uh, uh, another sister was born. And then at some point, uh, we were far in the, in the north, and uh, at some point, uh, my dad was uh, tired of the army, so he decided to quit, and uh, he went working for a company who was doing business with the west of Germany. And when the wall uh, collapsed, uh, this company uh, went bankrupt, because now the west could uh, buy stuff in the east, and... Uh, the company had no more customers and uh, he lost his job so we went uh, in the montreal region to live and uh, that's it uh, uh, we moved around a bit in uh, in quebec but, uh, so how old were you when you arrived at in montreal uh, maybe 12 13 years old uh, okay so uh when you were like you said you were at some point to live in the very north part of canada but was yeah. it uh, still in Quebec oh, or? It's not very north. Yeah, I don't know. Six hours from uh, from Montreal. But the temperature difference is uh, is big. Uh, maybe in Montreal you get maybe two meters of snow per year, a bit less. And there maybe it's six. Uh, and it's below uh, minus 30. It's, yeah, sometimes below minus 30 easily there. And uh, Montreal, it, it's it's rarer. So you're a French speaker since a uh, very young age then? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Until, uh, until I, I went in Italy for, uh, <laughs> I went out of the country, I had to speak English. So uh, I, I was speaking French all my life. Right. You don't actually have to leave your country to, to practice English. You can maybe yeah. go to another state. <laughs> but yeah, but there were no opportunities. Uh, everybody you meet speak French, so I guess it's like this in Brazil. I just speak with everybody uh, <laughs> Portuguese and uh, yeah. So, and, uh, uh, any any stories from that period uh, when your par your father was in the army, or you had a quiet childhood? No, it's like everybody. I think it was quiet and uh, mm -hmm. nothing much happened. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So at some point, uh, when you, you did, uh, you went to school and you have to choose a career. And can you describe how was the process of choosing the undergraduate yeah, course? That part, that part um, I wasn't very good at school until uh, I had a computer and I had my first programming class. I had a great retention when I was uh, maybe 13 or 14. So I lost a year of my life uh, because I was a stupid teenager. And a um, few years later, I got a computer. Everybody had a computer. My parents bought me one. And uh, I got a programming class in Visual Basic. Then I fell in love with programming and uh, mathematics. And suddenly, I became uh, better at school. So, so after that, it was quite clear that I wanted to, uh, uh, to. I wanted to be a programmer at the beginning. So here, before university, there is a 
we call it CEGEP. It's uh, it's between high school and the university, and you can get a technical formation. And I went there to be uh, to have uh, this technical formation in uh, programming. And uh, later on, at the end, you have an internship. And I went working for a company, and I had to do a software to uh, to schedule people but nothing related to operations research it's just like uh, i had to record the schedule of these guys and uh, when they come in uh, the office they have to punch and uh, when they go out they have to punch and uh, in this place they had um, they were cutting steel mm. you'll see me coming <laughs> <laughs> they were cutting huge plate of steel with a, a laser and the guy was explaining to me that like this this is very costly and uh, like you want to maximize the use of, of this steel so you don't want a bunch of uh, pieces that you cannot do anything with and then i said oh that's that's, good. that's interesting and that's cool and then uh, saturday morning i wake up and oh yeah maybe i can do some kind of uh, algorithms to put pieces together inside a big piece and uh, I, I coded something it was uh, awfully slow <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't know the name of this problem and uh, didn't know how to to like you know how to code it uh, like the, the, the culture of the of the algorithms around it and data structures I had no idea I did some things with dictionaries and it was it was very bad thinking of it now uh, wasn't so bad but uh, w when you compare it with uh, some other algorithms in the literature but it, it was bad and at that time uh, that's a bit later I, I I didn't know what what it was like this uh, packing problem and uh, when I decided to choose university, there was this operation research uh, field like that that was there, and uh, well, it's interesting. And I went at the, the University of Montreal in uh, computer science, and that's how I uh, started uh, at the university. Mm, so you went from a troublemaker kid to a, a yeah, a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 that's 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 nice uh i think you you had uh you need some some something to that really uh get your attention so you can put your efforts on it and yeah yeah so you it's nice that you found something that you'll enjoy doing and so how was the college years College years, college year were very interesting. Uh, you know, I was uh, my parents were living in the suburbs, and uh, always have the t two or three same friends that you see. <laughs> <laughs> then you arrive there at the university, your friends are not there anymore, and there is these thousands of people that you meet, and you you go. Uh, in the uh, student association you meet people you have fun uh, parties like it was the start of university was uh, was like that trying to and, stay uh, sober <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah exactly um was like that and um at the beginning i, I had a technical formation so i was uh, i was not going to every classes uh, uh, there was so uh, I remember the two first uh, programming classes were in uh, Java and uh, I wasn't going there like learning uh, if and uh, for loops I knew that so I wasn't going there and the uh, funny thing is that uh, the second uh, programming class was given by Jean-Yves Podvin wow. and I wasn't going to his classes <laughs> Then uh, someday he gave an homework, uh, like we have to code an algorithm to solve the TSP. I think it was the, uh, what's the name of this algorithm? Like best, uh, not best fit, uh, cheapest, cheapest uh, insertion. insertion. Yeah, okay. 
yeah, we had to do that. And, uh, well, that's interesting. And I played around it the whole weekend and I searched on the internet and there was this uh, website, VR, VRP Web, that I, I guess everybody yeah. knows now, found that. Oh, yeah, there, there is this other problem called the capacitated vehicle routing. Oh, that's interesting. Continue working on that and uh, well, I said my TSP won't work, and that went fine. And then I continue playing with the, the algorithm, trying to find better solutions. And at some point, I I get a, a cost that is lower than uh, one of the solutions that was reported there. That's cool. Then I went to see Jean-Yves, and I, I talked with him a bit, and uh, uh, told him of my solution. He said, oh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, we have to minimize the number of drivers first. <laughs> so, oh, <laughs> I didn't know. And uh, so I had the cheapest solution, but uh, was using more drivers. And uh, yeah, at the end of that semester, that was the end of the first year. And uh, I had nothing for the summer. And uh, at the same time, I had a class with um, first operations research class with Bernard Gendron and I quite enjoyed it and I had nothing I talked with Bernard and asked him if he had uh, some stuff and he gave my name to another colleague Theodore Krenik I don't know if you know him yeah yeah sure and he he had the job he interviewed me but at the end he didn't take me <laughs> You would have it had happens, a, a great student. <laughs> yeah, what are you describing? You know, since like uh, finding uh, uh, feasible solutions or finding improved solutions that we think, uh, you know, it's uh, something really important, and then you realize later on that was a bug or you uh, just did not understand the problem properly. It happens to all of us, and then yeah. you try to look for opportunities, and sometimes you're accepted, sometimes not. So, it's uh, it's a normal path. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, I'm yeah. surprised that you uh, you you heard of OR before entering the university. That's yeah, that's not common. Yeah, because of this uh, packing, cutting uh, stuff at the the company, but I didn't know the name at the time. <clears throat> so I didn't know it ah, was okay. cutting and packing. It was just like, oh yeah, there is those boxes. You put them inside this area, and was playing around. It's much later than. Maybe 10 years, no, like uh, maybe seven years later that I learned that it was a packing problem. But after one, two years uh, uh, of uh, your bachelor course, you already yeah. met very big names. Uh, but at that time, probably you were not quite aware they were so uh, important, maybe, no? Yeah, maybe later, later on. Uh, I didn't meet all of them. I met Jean, uh, Jean-Yves uh, quite early. Michel, uh, I met him because, uh, as I was saying, um, so I didn't have the interview for a job during the summer. And then uh, Jean-Yves uh, was involved in a company called uh, Why Wait For You? And they were looking for somebody uh, uh, to code the algorithm. So he, he sent me a mail, they are looking for somebody. So. So I applied, I got the job, and then... They I, were waiting for I, you to start. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I worked the whole summer, and we, uh, we had, I had to do an algorithm for the um, Courrier Express. So you have to do pickups and delivery inside a single day. It was a dynamic problem. It was very tough. Uh, it, was, it was very, very tough. And uh, Michel was also involved uh, with with this company, so I learned a bit uh, with those two. And uh, it didn't go well. This company went da- bankrupt. Well, they closed the doors. Uh, they, they had no customers. Uh, there were two associates there. They, uh, they, they, they had a fight, and one of them left. And uh, yeah. <laughs> It happens. Uh, yeah, it happens. This was early 2000s, late 90s? Uh, 2004, 5, 6, 7. 
Oh, okay. So when did you join oh. the the university? 2005. Oh, really? You started? Yeah. Uh, you you started university only in 2005 then? I lost a lot of time uh, earlier. Uh, grade retention, then you know, like grade retention. So you think of yourself, well, uh, I'm not very good, so I won't take any risk. I will take the easiest classes. When you take the year, when you take the easiest classes, like you, you cannot do uh, computer science. You, you cannot go in sciences. So I had to spend another uh, year uh, doing. Uh, so how old were you when you actually joined the university? Mm, maybe uh, twenty-two. I see. Yeah, I was I was old. No, yeah, but it's uh, compared to the other guys that they they are eighteen. Uh, I, I was a bit older. Do you think the fact that your your dad moved around like because you're a s part of the army uh, affected you somehow in your behavior as a at a young age? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I had difficulty integrating uh, when we moved. Uh, people there they have a different accent, <laughs> so when I arrived, well, people were making fun of me. And I had no friend, and, and there in this place, uh, it's the outdoor. So I was uh, uh, I was catching uh, hair, hairs. <laughs> yeah, every every two days I was going uh, looking for the my traps if I had caught any hairs. Uh, so th plenty of things outdoor, like playing outdoor all the time, winter, summer. Uh, there was a military base uh, at the end of the field behind our house, and uh, like in the the forest there, there was a, an old airplane, and uh, you know a, a military airplane. There were no three. There were three military airplanes. So imagine a, a young guy, ten years old, seeing this, and it was uh, broken, and we were going there playing. So you take me there, and then you put me inside the big city, and. Uh, uh, I didn't enjoy that part. Mm. I see. So uh, maybe, maybe that it. that that some impact on you because when you move around, you you kind of once you s you're in your some certain place, you start making friends, and then you move elsewhere, and then you kind of miss your old friends, and you have to adjust yourself. And as a kid and as a teenager, that can be very hard. As you mentioned, some some people can tough. when you're the new guy around, they can mock you, they can make fun of you, and oh yeah. I got that a lot. <laughs> and now you're giving back, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm saying that because uh, there, are my, there might be other people that are watching that also uh, started late at university or has, have some problem in engaging themselves in groups or finding friends, and that's perfectly normal um, yeah. and, you know, in your life. Um, so sometimes you just see you now, like you're a very happy guy, you joke around, we all love you, but uh, maybe uh, you, you, there was a process, uh, I mean, not, it, it was not always like that, probably, and then uh, you, were, you were telling me all this stuff, it's, it's yeah, quite yeah. interesting. I had some rough times, but I'm, well, I'm guessing a lot of people had a rough time. Yeah. So it's nice to show that you overcome all that and you, you find yourself uh, like you really uh, you found something that you really liked. And yeah. from that point onwards, I think you, you, you got the, the right track and that's nice. So you, you were there like it, the summer was over, you, the, the company was over <laughs> that you were working for. Oh, uh well, uh, first summer, uh, so we had to deliver uh, our software to this company and we failed. Uh, the guy didn't like our, our roots. <laughs> it's always the same problem in VRP. Yeah. And uh, so I went back to the university and uh, I think I was working there one day a week. And uh, I continued, and at some point, the two guys, the two owners, they had a fight, and uh, one had the money, the other had the ideas, and uh, the guy with the money won, and uh, the guys with the idea left. And uh, after some months, uh, the guy with the money 
couldn't figure out what to do to make this work. So we closed the doors and he closed the doors at the end of the summer. So I went back uh, to school and uh, at the university and I, I was fine. And another year passed and uh, I finished my uh, bachelor degree. And at the end of the summer, well, I, I knew like I wanted to do a master thesis uh, with Jean-Yves and with Michel. So I started that and at the same time, I, I wanted a bit of money. So I, I called the, the guy with the ideas and I said, oh yeah, uh, I'm free. I'm uh, looking for a job. Do you have anything? So say, oh yeah, yeah, you should come uh, working with me. Uh, you want to come Monday and uh, you're welcome. So I joined them Monday and uh, on that Monday it was in his kitchen. <laughs> 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 I had to go to his house, uh, to to his uh, girlfriend house, uh, to work, and uh, we were in his kitchen, and uh, there were like uh, three or four uh, other people, and uh, it was a startup. Like everything started from uh, from zero. Okay, usually you start at the garage, not in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So yeah, and two weeks, two three weeks later, we were in a, in an office uh, in in Montreal, uh, and uh, I worked there for from two thousand seven until uh, two thousand fourteen. Wow! And it was uh, basically the same uh, same thing. Uh, so we just. No, it's like Apple. Like uh, it's like cell phones before Apple. Like. Yeah, they were they were fine. Then then uh, they invent something with like that is very user friendly. So the functionalities were all there at the previous company, but um, it wasn't user friendly. It wasn't easy for the customers, so they were not uh, they were not happy with with that software. And when the new company uh, like. We had others' ideas on how things should be implemented, and it, it was the the way to success. Now they are still in business. There are like maybe thirty or forty people working there. Right. Uh, yeah. You, so you worked for you worked for seven years. Yeah. Yeah. Seven years there. Okay. And uh, what about your masters? What did you do? Uh, in my master thesis, so what did we do? Uh, I I heard the other talks by the other guys, and uh, I listened to Maria, and uh, she said something. And I think I had my master thesis. I wanted to work on a similar topic. Uh, I think it's VRP with uh, kind of exchange points uh, like uh, inter inter depot routes ah, okay. it's called mm, like mm, that mm. and uh, they asked me to do a branch and cut or i oh, know they asked me they gave me a dominique Fayez code for the uh, vrp with time window it was a, a branch and price mm. give me that and uh, oh yeah do that for the uh, <laughs> third depot route but I had no idea what the branch end price is. I had no idea what cuts are. And they give me this code that was like awful. And uh, I played around for like a week and then I went back to them and said, uh, no, no, uh, let's find another subject. And then we searched for like the garbage collecting. Maria said that. And nah, <laughs> didn't work for me. And uh, they, they, this, it was their idea. And at, at the first uh, meeting, I said, oh no, we should do something like with the pickup and deliveries with stacks. And like, there is this papers, they do that. There is this paper, they do that. And like, we can generalize that. But like, they, they were not listening to me. <laughs> so at first meeting, I said that, but they said, oh no, let's work with uh, this type of VRB. And oh, no, I don't like that. Then second meeting, suggest another thing. I try, oh, I don't, I don't like it. Third meeting, I say again, third time my idea. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, that might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked on that and uh, I got, I got uh, good results like for, uh, for a master student, we did a paper uh, with this in uh, networks. 
Mm, not bad. And uh, yeah, it took me a while. Yeah, computation times, like computing the results, uh, took me six months, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so your first paper was in networks. Yeah. Uh, no, it was in um, it was in Ejor. Mm. Uh, with Jean Yves, uh, there was a you know it's like some course you do a projects and I. Uh, I did an algorithms for the vehicle routing problem with uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, private carriers. Mm, mm, I know. Mm. Uh, so I think I found this problem. I said to Jean Yves, "Yeah, maybe I can try to do an algorithm." So we did a taboo search, and uh, uh, we did better than the the paper, the best paper at the time, who is was from a colleague from here. <laughs> uh, but I think it was it was better because I had a better implementation. Okay. Is this your most cited paper? I think so. You see, uh, uh, you know, the same thing happened to Claudio Contardo. <clears throat> I was talking to him the other day, and I think he mentioned that the the his most cited paper is from his undergrad work too. Yeah. In your case, yeah, uh, yeah I, were uh, in this case were you taking a master's course uh, when you had that project, or it was undergrad course? Uh, undergrad. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So you have you had your first paper published in EJR as an undergrad student. Yeah, yeah. So, so how did you feel? I didn't. Yeah, well, I was happy, but I didn't know like uh, EJR is a it's a good journal. Like I had no idea. <laughs> uh, okay, like great. Was happy. I I think I printed like the the paper and uh, I put it in my house and uh, oh. <laughs> I was happy. <laughs> But yeah, mm. and uh, uh, when did you far first start attending conferences? Was it still during the undergrad or in during masters? In Montreal, there is the optimization oh, days is, every yes. year. Mm -hmm. So I think I went in two thousand seven, uh, no, two thousand eight for the first time, and I nearly went every year uh, since then. And how was your English back then? Oh, it was bad. So how did you uh, manage what? to write the papers? Ah, but Jean Yves is a is a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> he, he he wrote both papers. Uh, the first two papers, my master's thesis, he he did it, and the undergrad project, he did it, and took him uh, four days. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He's a, a machine machine yeah that's very impressive you presented in english uh, in optimization days or oh no no i didn't present yet oh when was the first time you present a paper i think it was in 2009 optimization days yeah 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 so yeah you had to learn english then i don't know but i was uh like i i think i couldn't speak and listen uh, i was very bad at speaking and listening but i was okay at writing because I, you know, like every guy like me, uh, you're on the internet and you pay, you uh, play video games. So like I learn English this mm -hmm. way uh, because at school, uh, as I was not a very good student, I hated English. So uh, I learned uh, English uh, playing video games and uh, I, I was not so bad. Uh, Oh. Not so bad. So I went to the conference. I gave my talk. I don't remember if it was good. I think it was my English was terrible. Uh, but then it was 2009. So I finished my thesis. I was still working at that company. And I had a lot of moments where um, like I work full time at the company or I work like full time on my thesis. So I was I was never uh, doing uh, both at the same time. Ah, so on and off. Uh, yeah, I right. have some students now that they they work both at the same time. I don't know how they do. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. I'm on and off, so I'm full time on this or full time on that. Anyway. Right, and you stayed in Montreal up to 2014, working for that company. Uh, I stayed, no, 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 um, 2010, I started PhD. Ah, okay. Uh, and then uh, here there was this grant that you can apply for. It's an internship abroad 
you need to look for um, uh, how to say that like a padrino uh, uh, okay uh, somebody um, to advise you uh, abroad yeah yeah an, an advisor abroad yeah so uh, I went to Michel because Michel is uh, travels all the time he was <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I asked him like uh, yeah I would like I would like to go in UK because uh, I wanted to improve my English and I didn't want to go in the US because in the US uh, my mind uh, food is bad so uh, I didn't want to go there so wanted to go in UK I was thinking uh, yeah maybe food is better there <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't then think I, so but <laughs> I went to Michel and I said yeah you have like collaborators there that I I could do my internship there and he said yeah, why you want to go there like food is bad <laughs> fish and chips <laughs> and, and uh, it's raining all the time like why why you 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 want to go there and i for like 40 minutes like i make a suggestion he said oh no no don't go there like and don't go there and at some point i said oh yeah i could go to Italy like you know I listed a lot of <laughs> places and I said, he said oh yeah yeah and women there like food is good temperature is good and women there are very uh, <laughs> are very, <laughs> very nice and then I was uh, I don't know I was maybe 25 uh, 26 at that time and was easy to impress and yeah so, yeah so uh, I said okay yeah then he told me you want to go in Bologna or you prefer Brescia? And I didn't know a, any of these cities. And he said, like Bologna, how, how it would be. And then he told me Brescia, how it would be. And he said, oh, yeah. Uh, he, he described me uh, Brescia very nice and that uh, people there would take care of me. And OK, let's go. Let's go to Brescia. So uh, I went there to work with uh, Maria Grazia Speranza and uh, Claudia Chetti. I went there in uh, 2010. Oh, sorry, it was in 2009. I met Michelle and uh, I got the grant and I left in 2010, right at the beginning of the <laughs> PhD first semester. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I started working there on uh, an exact method for this uh, uh, pick up and delivery with multiple stack uh, problem and uh, worked there for like uh, five months. I had, I had a lot of fun and uh, that's how I learned to speak in English. That's where uh, sometimes people s tell me that I have uh, an Italian accent. Yes, <laughs> it happens. Um, I yeah, have this friend and, uh, as well. I have this friend. Uh, I don't know if you met him, Marcos Melo Silva. Uh, he was uh, he did PhD in France uh, and with a lot of Italians. He, and he, even his girlfriend is Italian. So now uh, uh, he speaks English with a perfect Italian accent. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of, it's a bit bizarre, you know, because I know him. He's from Brazil, and then he starts speaking, and he's he has this a very Italian way of speaking and. But it's, I mean, he can communicate, that's important. So uh, yeah. you, you, you learn English, but uh, at that time, it's where you, you start really doing the heavy exact stuff or you already did? Yeah, before? yeah, first time, yeah. So exact what, did you, what did you pick, like branch and cut, branch and price? Branch and cut, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like learning how to use the callbacks. And oh yeah, I learned that all by myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so... The they gave me some advice there because uh, uh, because I don't know my advisors they were not coders uh, maybe when they were young but uh, they they stopped coding uh, early on and there Claudia codes mm -hmm. I don't know if you know and yeah. uh, so she could give me a lot of good advices on uh, what to do with the callbacks and uh, this stuff so I learned all that how, like how to separate the sub tours like somebody needs to tell you that. yes exactly uh, yeah 
So I learned most of it with her and um, yeah. yeah. Learning exact algorithms can be tricky and you need a tutor or a mentor if you, if you will. Because uh, there, is a, there is a considerable gap between theory and practice uh, in that case. If you read a book and you see even the papers and from how to figure out, to, how to code that, how to figure it out, it's, it's uh, difficult. Yeah, there's a, there's a culture, like kind of knowledge that you won't find. Yeah. Or, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's tricky. That's why uh, if you want to do really exact stuff, uh, I had ex that experience as well, so I, when I kind of uh, supervise my students, uh, we, we, we have this sort of tasks uh, that we uh, provide them so they, so they can learn doing branch and bound, uh, Lagrangian relaxation, combining both, then branch and cut, with all, all, all with TSP, which is a standard problem, um, and then even column generation with being packing, moving to Brescian Price later on. So uh, we do that with the undergrad students, but they, of course, they need somebody to, to keep an eye and give all the hints. So that's, that's what you just uh, mentioned now. It's very important. Uh, sometimes uh, I, I, I heard cases that one uh, started to try to learn by himself or herself, and it, it can be very frustrating, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you're doing this at home alone, very tough. Uh, like me heuristic and meta heuristic, I think it's easy. Like you, you read what's in the paper, you implement them. Maybe you don't get the same results, <laughs> but at least you have something working. Yeah, you can uh, do something exactly because yeah, generating feasible solutions, uh, primal bounds can be less demanding at times than. Uh, of course, you can claim that you can implement a model and get the bounce straight from the solver. But uh, if you're doing the, the real exact algorithms and it can be very tough. And of course the heuristics you need, uh, advanced data structures or depending on how you, depending on the problem you're solving, you need to really take care of the move evaluation, all that part it can be very hard as well. Yeah. But I see what you mean, right? It can be, it's maybe the path is, less traumatic or less uh, do you know genius like g yeah. the genie insertion yeah, yeah. well i took the paper and i implemented it and i think my implementation was was good uh maybe not the best one but i think it was good i didn't have any code i just took the paper and did what it, it was in instead if you um, try to implement a typical branch and cut from a paper for the first time uh, it takes some time. Yes. And I think it's even worse branch and price. Uh, yeah. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Column generation can be a little bit tricky, but manageable. Uh, because you have to take into account all those other other things like uh, convergence yeah, problems, branching. stabilization. And once you have the root node, and then you have to branch. Root node is easy, but uh, yeah. branching is tough. Yeah, because you have to find a way to save memory and not, you know, having copies of the um, master problem everywhere. You have to manage the columns. So that is really annoying. I know that. So, yeah. So you're in Italy, uh, learning Italian, improving your English, learning exact algorithms, very happy. And yeah. what happened next? Oh, I met a girl there. <laughs> uh, you know, um, I don't know. Uh, like here, I think in, in Quebec in general, like if you if you think of Italy, like people are like, oh yeah, oh, wow, it's a nice place, nice, like everything is great. And oh yeah, women are great. And like, so you, like you arrive there, meet a girl, oh, it was great. <laughs> and uh, we, we had good time together. And then uh, I think she passed me, uh, uh, the kiss sickness, uh, what's the name of that? Um, uh, Menage? No, is it? No, it's not Menage. It's, uh, the, it's the kiss sickness. That's the name. Uh, okay. Uh, do you, do you know this? Mm. You probably got that. Like people get that when they are very young. 
I don't think so. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't recall yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, because <laughs> you were very young. And, uh, well, I don't know the name in English, but I got the, this, uh, this sickness and like I had eye fever, like 39. Uh, I went to Euro in Lisbon. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I came back and I went to the hospital like six times. They didn't know what I, what I had until like uh, one day I saw six doctors and uh, oh yeah, you maybe have that. They took a blood sample, they did the test and I got that. And uh, yeah, my friend got this uh, recently from his kid. Like you get the, the Milsa uh, very uh, <laughs> inflammated. Yeah. Anyway, I lost like uh, 10 kilos. Really? When I came back. Yeah. Yeah. When I went, I was very, very skinny. My mom was scared. Like, and uh, yeah, I stayed there like five, five or six months. And I continued this relationship with her uh, for like four years. I went there several times during my PhD, uh, maybe 10 times. I don't know. I stayed there like one month, two months, three months. In Brescia, uh, mostly? In Brescia, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Maria Grazia Speranza was very kind. Like she was giving me an office and I uh, could like work uh, on my thesis from there. I was going there every day and coming back to her home uh, every, every night. It was a very good time. Yeah. And you continue with that relationship until you finish your PhD or? Yeah, when I finished my PhD, there was just before finishing, uh, there was this job offer in Quebec City during the summer. And I, I saw that and I said, OK, I have to, to apply to it and to get it. I want this job. I was not so a, a big fan of Montreal uh, because because it's the big city. Uh, traffic, a lot of people, uh, the nature is far away. So, and I didn't know anything about Quebec City, but I was thinking, yeah, nature is, is near. And I, and I applied uh, to it. And I, I was telling myself, I, I, I have to get it. Like, uh, I want it. So I worked uh, maybe like at least maybe five weeks on the curriculum, on the presentation letters, on the... So I, I got uh, accepted for an interview. Then I, wore, I had to give a class, so I never gave a class in my life. <laughs> so I worked uh, like a week at least to, to make a one-hour class. Now maybe more than a week to, to make a one-hour class. And then I also had to do a presentation of a subject, uh, of a research subject. So I had no slide for the last paper of my thesis. So I created also uh, some slide for that. Uh, I worked. I worked very hard, and I I was really really prepared at the interview. Uh, for like for like two weeks, I was repeating myself <laughs> <laughs> in the mirror, like asking yourself questions and repeating all, over and over. Uh, but I ask friends and people I knew, like, can I present you my, uh, like, this course and you tell me if it's good or not? And, like, I, maybe 10 people. I, I presented my stuff to 10 people and uh, I arrived at the interview and uh, was they, they told me, like, that I was prepared. So that was just so, before you finished your PhD, you apply for that position. Yeah. So they were they were yeah. aware that you were about to finish, and you. They were aware. Mm -hmm. uh, I also had a uh, paper accepted in. Uh, so at that time, I had like uh, my paper in EJOR, two papers in Network. I had one accept. Uh, yeah, I had one accepted in OR, and another one in revision in OR. So my CV was uh, was looking good. Definitely, so, absolutely. So yeah. they, uh, they took me uh, for the interview and uh, it went well and they, uh, they offered me uh, the position. That's, that's amazing. Um, can you describe more uh, what did you do in your PhD? 
uh, the problems and the methods you worked? Uh, yeah, so uh, we talked a bit about my first uh, one, uh, the branch end code for the pickup and delivery and multiple stack. And after that, I I was searching a bit, like you know, you you have ideas, you try them, and all the ideas, like for my master, my PhD, they are from me. Uh, my advisor gave me some ideas, but. Um, no, I wanted to do my stuff. So uh, I tried many things, was not getting results. Uh, then I learned about packing problems. And um, while I was working at the company, I saw uh, a paper by Manuel. Ah. Uh, the two-dimensional vehicle routing <laughs> problem. I, I saw that. I think it's his most cited paper. Uh, I saw that as a technical report and uh, I was, oh yeah, I really liked uh, this stuff. And as I was working at the company, it was problems like that, that the, the company was facing. So I was uh, very interested in like learning about that, implementing that. So I was trying stuff and then at some point uh, I tried to have uh, an algorithm for the the packing of this uh, vehicle routing problem. Uh, this packing problem is called uh, the two-dimensional orthogonal packing problem with loading constraints. Mm. Uh, because when you, uh, you arrive at the customer, you open the rear door of the, the truck and you have to like to pull the stuff out. You don't move things around. You don't want like your boxes to be at the uh, at the front of the the truck, and you have to move everything around to get it. Uh, so I started doing a, a code uh, on that, and it was I think in May. And I went back to see my my girlfriend at the time, was working on that, and. Um, oh yeah, so how I, I, it's, I, I met Manuel before, um, so I met Manuel uh, while I was in Italy the first time. Uh, this problem I was working on, he had, uh, he had a specific, like a, a specific uh, version, like um, with one stack, and me, I was on multiple stacks. So we had already some uh, papers on that, and I I was implementing some of his cuts, and I sent him a lot of mail asking <laughs> him uh, questions on his cut and like why it's working, why it's not working. And at some point, he invited me to give a talk because uh, after uh, maybe three months, uh, three four months, I had good results. So he invited me there in the Jumilia, I gave a talk and. Uh, that's that's how I met him, and I think we talked a bit uh, now and then. And when I went back the third time, I told him I was working on packing problems and I was trying stuff. So invite he invited me in uh, Dream Media again, and he told me of an idea of uh, an algorithm for the the strip packing problem. Mm -hmm. So I implemented some stuff. And uh, it took a while. Uh, so we worked together on this uh, for for the, on this problem before submission. We worked maybe two years. Wow! Uh, I implemented maybe six or seven or more branch and bounds. And when I say branch and bounds, it's not a MIP. Like in, in packing problems, like you have your bin and then you place an item there. You create a node, and then you have the, those points. For each of those points, you will create another node. Yeah, it's a combinatorial uh, branch and bound then, right? Exactly. And uh, so I coded maybe you know, more than more than eight, like maybe 10. <laughs> we also <laughs> implemented so many MIPS, maybe uh, eight MIPS. Uh, I tried uh, maybe three or four branch and price, and at some point we got a good uh, a good setup, and 
uh, we got great results. Uh, we could solve many, many new instances. And uh, after a lot of effort, yeah, we sent our paper to, uh, to Operation Research and uh, yeah. it, was, it was accepted, yeah. Um, thanks to, it's part thanks to this uh, hard work and thanks to uh, Manuel, great writing. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's great. Uh, I had uh, the opportunity, of course, to collaborate with him quite a lot and it's, it's really fun especially in the very last stages of when you're very close to the submission, he gets a little bit anxious. Oh, yeah, because you, well, I guess I have bugs. <laughs> and results are, oh, yeah, they are not good. So I tell him that, oh, we will never publish. We will never finish. And <laughs> he gets a bit crazy on yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I mean, uh, once you get used to that, you actually you start to laugh a little bit and enjoy. You know, it's it's part of his nature. He's a super cool guy, um, and I noticed that you collaborated a lot. You're uh, close to each other. Uh, can you describe? Uh, I mean, the the your relationship with Mano Yori. I think it's uh, he 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 likes you very much. He, when he was in Brazil several times, when he visited us, he was always on Skype with you. That's why. I, this is like where when we met, I think around 2013 yes. or 14 for the first time, and uh, so how why why this uh, collaboration works uh, so well? I think it, I I don't know. Uh, it's friendship. Uh, we are lucky in our field, like to have a long-term relation with people. Uh, like when you work in a company in a business, like yeah, you have your colleagues, but they go they leave and you don't see them again or maybe they become close friends but they leave and us as a researcher well we stay in university all our life and we do this all our life so I will stay uh, probably a professor all my life thinking of Claudio now <laughs> <laughs> uh, Manuel will probably stay a professor all his life so I will continue and uh, this great relationship with him for several years I hope and uh, yeah it's, it's friendship so uh, he invited me many times uh, in the last year I was spending maybe a month uh, there per year mm -hmm. uh, not every year but I, sp I spent a lot of time uh, there mm -hmm. and I really enjoy uh, this place right and you you're working at that company and when did you decide, like you heard about the, the position, you mentioned that, yeah. and you really worked hard to get approved, yeah. and get accepted. Yeah. But you never like had any experience as a professor. Why did you uh, decide to change paths, like leaving the, the yeah. industry? Until there, I, was, I wanted to work in, uh, in the private sector. Uh, um, until just before the end of my PhD. Maybe I was not thinking that I could become a, a professor. I, I was really impressed when I was younger by, you know, there, were, there are a lot of uh, great people in Montreal. Like there is Michel, there is Gilbert, there is Cordeau. <laughs> yeah, I know. There is, but there is also, um, uh, what is his name? Monsieur Soumy, François Soumy, mm -hmm. he basically invited column generation. And uh, I, I was really impressed by, by these people. And uh, they were really nice. Eh? I got, like, they were all nice. I knew them. I, I got a class with François Soumy. It's my best class ever. Not everybody says it's uh, their best class ever. But for me, it was, I really, really enjoyed this class. They were really nice. And... Uh, like uh, Bernard Gendron, like they are very like high level researchers and I don't know, I wasn't seeing, my, seeing myself as a professor at the time. You know, like you, uh, you I don't know, I, um, I had great retention, uh, like I wasn't thinking I was very good 
at some point I was thinking I was stupid. <laughs> like, how could I do better than, than these guys? And uh, uh, I think, like, uh, at some point I wanted to le also leave the university and, like, just find a job, a different job, not programming, like something else. And I, I couldn't uh, find, uh, like, I, I was, I was a bit lost. Mm. And I, I did some course on personal uh, work, like you work on yourself. And really? I, I discovered, yeah, yeah. Like coaching and stuff like that? Yeah, 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 it was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah wow. it was great. Yeah, I did that. And I, I discovered that, uh, that I was not stupid. Well, maybe I'm an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that too. And uh, so, uh, yeah, and then I, that I, I like uh, operations research and, and these things. So I had uh, other opportunities to work in other companies, uh, in the private sector. And uh, I work in some other places uh, as well. And uh, I think I was going to do that, but I don't know. At that, that summer before finishing my PhD, it was a, it was a click. Like I, oh yeah, I want to become a professor. I like this life. Uh, I was traveling a bit uh, as a, a PhD student. I went to few conferences, uh, doing research, having no boss. Uh, really, <laughs> like, made sense at the, that time. So I, that, it's like that. It's, it's yeah. Yeah, I remember that time. Mano was. Um, talking that, uh, about the possibility of you getting hired in Quebec City. And he was uh, really uh, hopeful that you would get. And he was telling me, I, I, I think he's one of the 10 people you presented your uh, class or something, or because he was quite aware mm, of the process. No? Oh, yeah. I'm not sure because you, I, I remember clearly that you were applying for that position and uh, he told me that you were uh, really involved and focused so when you uh, explain this now it, it just it, I just you know it, it rang me a bell that uh, okay I think I'm familiar with this story somehow so uh, I know that Mano was really uh, looking forward because I think he wanted uh, you to get established so he can keep on working with you otherwise if you just leave academia uh, for, oh. for good <laughs> he found a code yeah. so I, I would have never seen him again yeah yeah so for then sure. you got the position and you basically you had to oh, start yeah, teaching I, I could not go back to Italy and uh, back and forth for that girl and I told her well if you want to stay with me you will have to come here <laughs> and uh, she said oh yes but in four years, I was like, four years? We, we just lived four years together? No, I, uh, I cannot. I cannot wait four years. So we broke up. Wow, so you were, uh, you were heartbroken then? Oh, yeah. That uh, I heard too. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but then you have a new career, you have to start teaching. How was the process? Did you adjust? well or it took some time for you to get used to the new routine i know it was tough uh it was very tough uh um it was very tough it took me um, i was very stressed very stressful um the first semester was okay i had only one class and it was operations research uh, modeling problems and this stuff and was okay but um, it's it's the first time you learn that like there's a difference between uh, knowing something and explaining it and like I had to explain the uh, the theory like the uh, the primal and the duals and uh, mm -hmm. forgot the name of that um, so it was it was very you difficult mean duality theory or 
or uh, sensitivity no, the analysis? The theorem of uh, ah strong duality. Yes, exactly. The bounds they are the same for the prime and dual, and the solutions are all yes, okay. yes, <laughs> yes. So you you have to to look into the proof and to be really sure and you know all <laughs> know all the details because you have to explain it to somebody. Yes. So it was not easy, but it was okay. But then semester after that, I had to teach uh, project management, and uh, I had no zero knowledge of that. So I had to learn from scratch, like preparing a course for something you don't know is terrible, and then going to present it in front of people, it's even worse. <laughs> so it took me maybe three years to be comfortable in project management. Wow. And then when uh, you're settled down, then they give another class, right? And that the process no, starts or, no, <laughs> no, here they, they are quite nice. Like no, sometimes you, it happens. You, I'm not saying that it happened to you, but sometimes I, I heard cases that uh, the guy takes some time for a guy to, to adjust and be, feel comfortable uh, teaching one particular subject. And then out of the bloom, some guy retires or whatever. And then he has to, he or she has to start working, uh, start teaching a different subject and it yeah. can be super stressful because you you think that oh finally i got to that stability and then suddenly you were again uh, as you were three years or two years ago so, uh, so and then so it took about three years in that case of project schedule for project, project management in fact right yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah at least three years it was very stressful like i was uh at the girlfriend at the I think it was the third time I was teaching it, and I was telling her, "Ah, no, we, I cannot see you Sunday night. I cannot see you Monday, because I was preparing <laughs> for my Tuesday night class, and um, <laughs> it was like that. And it was taking a lot of time. And how did you manage then, doing research and teaching during that period? Uh, you'll see, uh, <laughs> there are not many papers." <laughs> No, it was uh, teaching was taking a lot of time. Yeah, I mean, for sure you did a very nice work uh, in terms of research, as one can see uh, your publications. Can you list your main contributions? Uh, was it like the combinatorial banders for packing problems or something you did with packing and routing? Yeah, I'm thinking, uh, like, if I had to name a single contribution, well, uh, of course, like this thing with combinatorial uh, benders decomposition, we reused it, uh, and I reused it many times in other papers. Uh, so for sure, like, it was uh, kind of a discovery for me. And it's, uh, like, you reuse your old stuff. So, That's normal. Uh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> uh, so this is one thing that I, I use a lot. And um, also, uh, I don't know if you know cover inequalities. Um, you mean next sub cover inequalities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have some types of cover inequalities in one of my papers. And uh, I re like, it's not that much. Like, um, I, I found out that if I relax some things in my uh, problem and then there is these special types of inequalities that uh, I can add, and there are some kind of cover inequalities, and it made me learn the cover inequalities, and then I reuse these things uh, a bit everywhere now. Right. And can you describe a little bit in detail the, combina the idea of your combinatorial benders uh, applied for the packing problems? Uh, basically, it's, it's, it's a simple idea. It's like you need first to relax some part of your problems. And you want the remaining model to keep uh, a structure. Like you want the solution of this new model to, to have a structure. It's not like costless, like it, it has something, like it gives you some information about your problem. 
So this relaxation, uh, then you solve it, and you check the solution, and from this solution you try to build the solution to your original problem. So it might mean that you need to solve another problem. So in, in packing, uh, what we did is like, okay, so we relax the, like if we are in 2D, we have X and we have Y. So we relax uh, one of those, one of these di dimensions. So let's say we relax the Y. So we don't have to decide the Y coordinates of our item. Solve this thing. And then in the second step, well, you have to find the Y coordinates. So you search for that. And if it's, it's not feasible, so you, you take the, the, the X that you found, check for the Y. If it's not feasible, uh, then you add a cut cut your your solution it's a basic uh, basic scheme uh, so you have this uh, with benders you have this even with uh, like typical branch and cut like the sub two elimination constraint you lax them you check if it's uh, if it's satisfied if it finds a violated sub tour you add it so it's a bit the same uh, but uh, what we did more is like we try to search for the minimal infeasible uh, solution. So from our set of x coordinate, we remove some items. We know it's not feasible for the y. We remove some items. Like if we remove one, and if it, and it's infeasible, then we can add a stronger cut because. Uh, our right hand side is lower and our left hand side has one less variable. Uh, so you, you cut more solution and you repeat this few times, you remove, you remove some item until you find a feasible Y solution. At this point you backtrack, you get the latest, uh, like the smallest infeasible set and then you, you can add your cut. And from that infeasible set, you can also try to improve it. Like, can you add more items? So it's like you have a constraint. Can you add variables without changing the right-hand side? So uh, we have, uh, in many papers, uh, we, we, I have this uh, schema. So try to find the, the solution, remove items. Find, find the smallest right hand side, and then I try to add as many possible on the left hand side. Uh, it's, it's a bit the idea of these uh, combinatorial benders. But Great. it's like a, you can see this idea everywhere. Yeah. No, nice, nice. Well, uh, you now, as an established uh, professor, uh, you were, of course, supervising uh, graduate students and yeah. And can you describe the experience of being on the other oh, side? Oh, I think it's great. It's great. Um, I, I did uh, renew my uh, year. We have a grant that lasts for five years, and you have to renew it every five years. I renewed my grant, and uh, you have to do your CV. And I counted how many students I had. And I got 39 uh, in the last uh, six years. Wow, that's uh, super, that's a impre I mean, among masters and PhD students. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a lot. Uh, most of them are master student, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I got a lot of students, and uh, I like the and I learned a lot from Manuel, like how he he was uh, dealing with his students, like how uh, how was the relationship with the students. Uh, in Montreal with my uh, my professor, I would say my old professors, well, I have to send a mail if I want to see them, and then they schedule an appointment, then I see them, then we talk about our subject, and then, okay, that's it. Uh, with Manuel, it was more like a friendship with the students, and I... And, and I appreciate that, and I try to, to have that with my students. Like, uh, I want to learn more about them, who they are, what they are interested in, and uh, try to have them learn. Like, if, if I couldn't do this uh, thing with the inter the VRP with the 
enter the pool route is because my advisors they were not like there all the time teaching me how to do like a branch and cut or a branch and price. I had to go somewhere else to learn it. So with my student, I try to be closer to them so they can then learn how to do stuff. That's fantastic. Uh, I use exactly the same policy. Uh, that's very important because sometimes the student, they, they, they have insecurities or they're afraid to ask some silly questions. And when they understand that it's finally okay to do that and there's no problem and there are no boundaries, and they can be free to talk about whatever they want. Um, that helps because you you kind of end up uh, learning how to to deal with each specific student and how to take the best from him or her. So uh, it's uh, it's a process that uh, not many people do it. At at the same time, you have to give some credit to those that are super busy because uh, they might they might have administrative work. They might be very important uh, people in terms of, uh, you know, uh, they have a chair that they have to manage a lot of oh, people. Like Michel was uh, the editor of Transportation Science and yeah, uh, a, it's a huge he work. had 20 PhD students. <laughs> 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 I don't have this amount. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, in, in my case, for example, I have mostly undergrad students, so we don't even have a PhD program so far. And uh, what you do with your graduate students, we do with our undergrad students. And I, as I mentioned before, and with, when I was talking to other people, uh, we have to make them learn as early as possible so we can uh, at least have them mature enough to, to work with some, um, at least uh, some fairly simple exact algorithms, at least. Sometimes we can push a little bit depending on the, the level of the student. And of course, the heuristics, which is uh, uh, less complicated uh, to like the learning curve, curve uh, I think it's, it's uh, much more effective. But w well, uh, I think we share that in common, that, that, that we really care about the student in the sense of uh, getting closer to them and, and having that sort of a friendship. At, at, at some point, yeah. So if, uh, if somebody wants to work with you, what what he or she do? You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> just what do you mean? Just send you an email. If one wants to apply for you, uh, apply to, to, to like, for example, for a yeah, PhD yeah, position. Yeah, yeah, send me an email. Send me an email. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Simple. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, is how many uh, positions per year you have? Uh? It depends on my funding. So, some years, um, because now I have four PhDs, and uh, some other students uh, doing a master's with me. And here, we, uh, we have to pay them mm -hmm. sure. uh, the PhD. And uh, it's an important amount. So some years, uh, well, I have uh, my grants and I, I try my best, but I'm I'm on a budget. And uh, this year with COVID, uh, it's the explosions of budgets. So uh, right now I, I have uh, some possibility. Well, yeah, I have some possibilities. Uh, I don't advertise that much these days because I. Uh, I'm a bit busy. I have four, and uh, as I told you, like I, I work with them. So I'm on Skype. I'm on WhatsApp. I'm on Messenger. I'm on uh, the mails. I'm on plenty of platforms to like they send me stuff and I take care of them. Uh, but two of them will finish uh, probably in December, so I will have some space. And uh, yeah, if some student wants uh, to work with me, uh, you can send me a mail and uh, we, we look at that. Great. Well, uh, Jean-Francois, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, merci you beaucoup. Uh, it was great. I, I knew it, I would have a lot of fun talking to you as, as, as it often happens. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you soon. Again. Uh, yeah, again, sure. 
uh, last time was we, we had a lot of fun and of course you still owe you owe me a visit here uh, yes so yes I will uh, I will try to come you know I'm in a sabbatical uh, not year but uh, I have the two winter semester including this one mm -hmm. I'm uh, in sabbatical uh, this now now it's it's a bit sad because yeah. uh, I can't travel but I'm hoping next year I, I can travel and yeah. uh, if, if uh, I can go at Brazil to see you I would be very happy to you're most welcome you you know Bruno Brook is also here you you're he's yeah. also uh, your friend so uh, you can make use to to uh, visit the place and go to the beach and we can have some fun around too so thank you so very much uh, thank you very much Francois Jean-Francois once again and thank you. Uh, we will uh, let's hope we meet uh, someday soon yes ciao bye ciao ciao